let's start with the word of prayer before we continue our journey through the book of Romans. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name to give you thanks and praise. Lord, we do glorify your name. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. We thank you for his precious shed blood. We thank you for his, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we thank you, Father God, that we are born again in and through him. That, Lord God, you have called us by name. That our names are written forever in the Lamb's book of life. We thank you, Father, for the gift and the indwelling and the immediate presence and the power and the counsel and the leadership of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the truth of your word, Father God. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you know us. And that, Lord God, we just give you thanks and praise and do anoint and bless each one here, each one who will watch this, uh, this message. Anoint my heart my mind, my very soul, my lips, as I bring this message forth for the glory of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue our journey through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And tonight's reading, to begin us, to, to get us started off with, I'm going to be beginning in Romans chapter 1, and we'll be covering, I'm going to start with verse 18, although tonight's message will be focused upon 24 through 27. But let's read this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. The men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So as we begin tonight, uh, we begin to uh, look in Romans chapter 1, 18, verse, you know, verse, chapter 1, verse 18 through Romans 3, 20, we get in some pretty tough sledding, so to speak. Uh, there are some very difficult passages there, and of course we're covering some of them tonight. And as a teacher and a minister, we, we dare not... Uh, do any injustice to the passage. We have to be, I believe, teach the whole counsel of God. Matter of fact, James chapter 3 verse 1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become, become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. I can assure you I keep this verse in mind every day of my life as I seek to teach and preach the gospel because it's so important uh, that by God's grace and by His anointing and His call that, that we get it right. Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul talking to the leaders of Ephesus uh, in Miletus, he, he says here something that, that, that is, is profound to a teacher. He says, therefore I test, testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And I think that's an interesting passage there because he's saying I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Why? Because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The inference there is quite clear is that if he perhaps would not declare the whole counsel of God, that there may well be uh, some culpability on his part, some responsibility, some accountability, some shedding perhaps of blood by not teaching and preaching the truth. So, as we go into these passages tonight, uh, you know, again, verse 24, God also gave them up. 
And this is basically what's happening here is that you, 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 we have people, there are people who basically they, they, are suppressing, they are suppressing the truth of God's word. They deny God. They want nothing to do with God. They want to, they want to live life by their own definitions. They want to do, they're, they're dead in their set, trans, sins and trespasses and they, don't, they know it not. They're blinded to the truth of, of God's word. And, and what happens is, is that God continues to, to, to strive with them and to woo them and to, to, to look into creation and all the things around them. And, and, and he will send people across their path perhaps to minister to them and share the gospel or to, or to encourage them in some way. But what happens is, is they will continue. They will continue to to refuse him, to refuse that call. They will continue to refuse to glorify him. They will continue to refuse to not be thankful to him. Their thoughts will be darkened. Their heart, foolish hearts will be darkened. Their, 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 their thoughts will be abstract and, and disconcerted. And they will, be, they will profess to be wise. But the Bible says they became fools. And what happens is they create gods of their own making. He says in verse 23, they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And, 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 and so what this is talking about is idolatry, this ungodliness we speak of in verse 18, and unrighteousness, ungodliness as we spoke of in the, in the previous weeks. Ungodliness is that situation where we no longer have a vertical connection with God we don't recognize him. We refuse to thank him. We refuse to acknowledge him in any way for who he says he is. And that creates ungodliness. And a byproduct of that, once the vertical is gone, our horizontal relationships with our fellow man results in unrighteousness in the way we treat one another and, and, and abuse one another and sin against one another. And as I mentioned last week, we can never truly have a proper horizontal relationship with our fellow man unless we have a proper relationship with our Creator God. So what happens here tonight, what we're talking about in verse 24, God gave them up. He gave them up to, the, uh, to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served other things. Verse 26 God gave them up to vile passions. Then he talks about that even the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. The men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. The New Living Translation has those verses in 26 and 27 like this. This is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with, their, with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of their sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. In studying this message, one does well to, I believe, look at, in this particular case, I have 12 translations here, and, I really, and, and if we go back... You know, we have the 1611 King James, and if we go back even further to this same passage in the 1534 William Tyndall Bible, which predates the King James. King James has about 80% of the 1534 Tyndall in it. You go back to 1534 and say, well, are we missing something here? Can it really just mean what it says, or it means something different? Well, William Tyndall for this cause, God gave them up unto shameful lust, for even their women did change the natural use unto the unnatural. And likewise, also the men left the natural use of the woman, and bread were burned in their lust one on another. And men, man with man wrought filthiness and received in themselves the rewards of their error, as it is according. Oftentimes what we'll find in Scripture is... You know, again, once you, once you read a passage that perhaps poses some difficulties or some challenges or some hard truths, I always encourage you to, 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 to read it. And, and, of course, with Internet access, it's easy to do uh, when, in all the technology we have. But read it in 5, 6, 10, 15, 20, 30 versions if you want. Uh, because, again, you may not be a, a Greek scholar in this particular sense of the word, but I can assure you 
by the time you get through 20 Bible translations on a particular passage, you've been through a boatload of Greek scholars. That's who puts these things together. It's just not some guy working out of a minivan under a bridge somewhere. You've got hundreds of scholars and, and with all kinds of letters behind their names coming up with these different types of things. So when in doubt, just pick up a few more versions. And that's what I did. You can go all the way back as far as you want to go. But basically, this is what it says. And why are these verses controversial? Well, I believe in today's culture, it speaks clearly to those things that would have to do with homosexuality and lesbianism and things like that. The Bible clearly addresses this here. And so what, what happens when we get to these types of verses, some of the things that laid on my heart this week, is we try to avoid them. We don't want to be confrontational. We don't want to hurt feelings or step on toes. But we have to be mindful that not everything in God's Word is simply on a dessert menu or what we'd like to hear. And many people do indeed approach Christianity. This is very much like we approach a dinner buffet. We look right away for the desserts and pay little attention to what perhaps is more healthy and needful. And I would also encourage each one that while it's convenient to have a preacher or a teacher hand you a shiny gold nugget or two from Scripture and say, here, here you go, see you next week. It's far more to your benefit if you open your Bible with a pick and shovel in hand and begin to dig and continue to dig and continue to dig. I firmly believe that the Word of God in one hand and the Holy Spirit within your heart, you can learn a great many things and you'll find that God has lessons for you and He wants to teach you one-on-one -on -one if, if given the time. I personally find soundbite Christianity of little use. So we look at these passages here and some of the difficulties here. I think what we have to do is look at the context of what's being written, if you will, that basically that the, the women turned away from the natural way to have sex, indulged in sex with each other, men doing the same thing, no sex with the women, burned with lust for one another, they did shameful things with other men. And so we have to define, if you will, what God's plan is here. I think we need to establish that firmly. Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Jesus speaking, but says, God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, since they are no longer two but one, and let no one split apart what God has joined together. If we go back a little bit farther in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, in the New King James, then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We follow up in the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. We see Adam gave names. This is kind of a re recap of what happens, a further explanation, if you will, an expansion of what happened in Genesis chapter 1. Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. He slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. A man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. So we see that God made them male and female. It's a simple choice. You, we are, God creates us male or female. And what one perhaps believes in addition to that is on you, but the Bible, I'm here to represent the Word of God and to teach the Word of God. And everyone can, of course, come to their own 
ideas on how they want to live their, live their life and how they want to identify sexuality and how they want to identify themselves and separate, well, these are the sexes and these are the genders and one thing being biological, one being some type of psychological identity. You know, I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight, so to speak, except I am going to teach the word as the word is given and just stand on this rock. And I have no animosity towards people who believe or think differently, but I would just suggest to you that there is a way to believe biblically. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. Now, we have clearly shown what God has in mind in terms of his creation, male and female, men and women, husband and wife. Let's dig a little deeper into how God would have us to behave. Because again, he's talking about things that God has given them over to, you know, sexual sin, sexual immorality. That here is clearly... Uh, shown in these, in these passages as a punishment, not as a blessing, by the way. He gave them over to these things. So to better understand what's going on in Romans chapter 1, we need to see what other instruction the Bible gives us in regards to what is and what is not proper biblical sexual behavior. Paul addresses another instance of sexual wrongness in 1 Corinthians, where what appears to be a professing member of the faith was living in ongoing sin. This particular sin was actually a group of sins, perhaps, sex outside of the bonds of marriage between male and female in addition to incest, and one could technically throw in adultery as well. So let's go to this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Paul is writing his letter to the church in Corinth around 57 A.D., about a year before he writes to Romans, the Roman church. He says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning and sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in the Spirit, and as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Paul had a very strong message to the church in Corinth for what they were simply looking over. There was sexual sin in your midst, in your congregation. You were doing nothing about it. Paul did not turn a blind eye to it. He called them out on it. And we see here that he writes a few verses down in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Read now the New Living Translations. Your other versions will read very much like this. When I wrote to you before, which infers a letter prior to 1 Corinthians, as we have in our Bible, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave the world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Paul tells them, it is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as Scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. This is Paul writing to the church. He's writing to the believers, and he's giving them some walking orders. This is how you are to behave, and this is how you are to deal with these things. So we see that, wow, this is hard stuff. I don't like that, that, you know, God is love and, and, and God, he, he just wants to cuddle me. No, God is a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness. You dare not separate the two. He is a loving God and a holy God. 
And what Paul is talking about here is that which is for the good of the man, the people involved in this, but it's also as, as, as a means of preserving the church. And, 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 and why is that? Because, because this, the, if you let it go, it, it, it spreads, if you will. It spreads, if you will. And, and we, we can't simply have that. What Paul is talking about is that you, you can't, you, you, it's like a little yeast that spreads throughout the whole batch of dough. There's a very real danger in allowing sin to continue in the midst of the body of believers. Apparently, Paul thought so. He says, throw this guy out. He said, I, 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 this sexual immorality among you. I mean, I can hardly believe the report, he says. And then he follows up in his second letter, written later in the same year, probably around 57 A.D. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, he says, I am not sorry. Listen to this. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you. Though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. And we've been talking about repentance quite a bit, right? You know, Paul identifies that here. Just because you're sorry doesn't really mean anything in the big picture. He's looking for godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, which means we turn away from, from our sin and turn into God. And, and this, this is written to a body of believers, by the way, the church in Corinth. He's not writing to unbelievers here. He's writing to believers. So here's the thing. For Christians, there is still a place for repentance in your life for the sin that you commit. I'm not speaking of losing your salvation or salvation by works. I'm just simply talking about the simple truth that as we commit sin, we do well to repent of that sin as Christians and ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And if you do not do that, well, I, I've been saved. I don't need to ask that. You know, you know, you're on a, you're 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 taking a really bad class because you are separating yourself from God, and say, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and I just trust I got my hell insurance. It's going to work out. And again, I think that's a bad class to take. And that's not what Jesus has called us to do. But Paul has a very stern view of sin, as does God. So let's explain. Let's, let's, let's explore this a little bit better because we have to peel the onion here and say, okay, you know what's going on here? You know, first God is turning sinful people over to sexual sin in Romans one. Read the passage in Romans one again. God is not blessing their sexual independence. He's not blessing their sexual preference. He's not condoning their their sexual freedom. God is not winking at homosexual and lesbian behaviors. Rather, God is giving them up to their sin. Paul is quite clearly reprimanding the church in Corinth for the sexual immorality that they are tolerating in their fellowship. They are not recognized as two consenting adults. They are not recognized as those simply exercising, exercising their freedoms. After all, we love each other, and God loves us, and we're not hurting anyone, so it must be okay. We're members of the church, or at least he was. No, quite the contrary. The man is placed under judgment by a loving God, but let us not forget a holy, sinless, and righteous God. And we look at these passages here, too, particularly in First or Romans chapter 1, there's going to be false teachers, that, and they're already all around us. We have, we have churches for people who, who believe they can be Christians and still involved in this type of, 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 of behavior. It doesn't line up with Scripture. One of the things they'll do is look at the word natural, and that Strong's number of 5446, and what they want to do is, is so often the case, in today's politically correct and cancellation culture, is simply to redefine what words mean and to make them say something they were never meant to say. 
So what this means is it's not just the natural use or the natural the way that men and women are built, but it's what's natural in terms of do I have a natural affinity for this guy or do I have a, a woman has a natural affinity. It's a natural thing for us. It's not, not unnatural for us. It's we naturally do this. No, it's sin. If we look at the word usikos, 5446, 5447, from the Greek word 5449. If you look at the Strong's, the Thayer's, the Robertson's word pictures, the Vincent word studies, the Vines, the NAS New Testament Greek lexicon, it basically, it, it all means the same by nature, inborn, by instincts. It's common sense. Man and woman go together. Man and man do not. That's, that's, not, that's not the creation event. That's the, it was never meant to be that way. And a matter of fact, to prove that even more, God is turning them over to their sin of doing what? Women with women's sex, men with men. He's turning them over to that. They are committing what is shameful. And that's what the Bible clearly says. Now, if we look at this, we continue to peel the onion here, trying to be objective. Well, what does the Bible say about this? And, and of course, you know... the. You, you, we want to seek the truth of it, but well, let's talk about this. Sexual immorality is mentioned no fewer than 45 times in the New Testament. As a point of reference, idolatry in its various usage is mentioned some 49 plus times, pride 41 plus times, doubt 44 plus times. With that said, however, nowhere in the New Testament is sexual sin and sexual immorality clearly detailed and defined. Paul is writing both Romans and 1 Corinthians well before the New Testament as we know it was complete. So you ask questions of the text. What is sexual immorality? It's in the, is it clearly defined? It's alluded to? It's talked about? It's, it's, it's a sin? We know that clearly in Scripture. But how did he arrive at, his, at his, his, his description of it or the rules of the road? How does he define that? Well, if you look closely, we have a problem here. How do you define it? How did Paul define it? How are we to understand it today? Both Corinthian letters and both the Corinthian letters, first and second Corinthians and Romans, were written somewhere between 57 and 58 AD. What, did the, what else did the early church have to go on? James was written in approximately 46 AD. First and second Thessalonians, 50, 51, and 52. Galatians 56. First Corinthians, which we just talked about, written in 57, followed later that year with 2 Corinthians. And then we get to the letter Paul wrote to the church in Rome was 58 A.D. So you can see quite clearly, and, and, and maybe, maybe Matthew or Mark was written maybe in the mid-50s. We, there's all kinds of scholarly debate going on with that. But they didn't have the whole New Testament at all. So how does one arrive at sexual immorality? How do we define that? What does that even mean? Because, again, if you put yourself in the place of the person getting the letter in Corinth or the person getting the letter in Romans and we talk about these things, how do we define, what, how, do we define how we're supposed to live? What would they have to go on? Well, I believe that if we know that Paul was raised... As a devout Jew and a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he would certainly have something to go on. And if we would look at ourselves today thinking, well, when there is no Scripture text here, what do we do? Well, he actually tells us this in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. And he gives a story about things that happened in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10.1, he says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. He goes down in verses 6, 7, and 8. These things, the things that happened to them, and he's, he's explaining this. Because, the, the, because, again, when he wrote this letter to 1 Corinthians, Corinthians, it was written a year before he wrote the letter to Rome. So it's about 57 A.D. So this was even earlier. He says, these things happened as a warning to us 
so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, these people celebrate with feasting and drinking. They indulge in pagan revelry, and we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. And we finish up in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10. These things happen to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So we see that these things in the Old Testament were shown and written to us in the New Testament age as a warning, as an example on how then we should live. So basically what you will hear oftentimes, well, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Well, here's the thing. We're not talking about Levitical diet laws or how to cut your beards or whether it's good to have a tattoo or not. We're not talking about whether or not we can eat a ham sandwich. We're talking about much deeper issues with much more serious consequences. Paul defines sexual immorality as sins against your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That ups it just a little bit. What do I mean? 1 Corinthians 6.13 says, Food for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it, it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And he goes on in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul lays it out quite clearly. We can look back to the Old Testament as for examples on how to live. We are not under the law. We are redeemed from the law. But yet there are examples in the Old Testament how we should live. Well, that's Old Testament. I'm not going to do that. Paul is telling us right here, these things were written to be your, as a warning, as an example on how then we should live. What else did they have? The New Testament wouldn't be completed for another 50 years. You're writing to, you're, you're writing to a people that, that all they had, Many of them were, were, were scrolls or perhaps parchments or, or some collection of Old Testament books. That's all they had. The New Testament was a baby. It was still coming about. How then should we live? Well, Paul does exactly what Paul knew to do because Paul, the New Testament wasn't complete for him either. And so that's why he tells us that we need to look back. And, and, and learn from these things. And say, so, so you, you look back and say, okay, well, what, do, what do we find out here? What do we learn? Are there any scriptures at all, Paul, that can help us? And yes, there are. If we look in Leviticus 18 as an example, you see, if you will, a complete a complete fleshing out of what God considers sexual immorality. Paul tells us to look to the Old Testament these exa as examples and warnings and to learn from them. We're not looking to them for our salvation as such. That's in Jesus Christ and Him alone. We, we repent and we believe it's a free gift, unmerited, His unmerited favor. This is not about that. This is about how to live on this side of the cross. So we look in Leviticus 18. What's some of the highlights here? The Lord speaking to Moses. Give these instructions to the people. I'm the Lord your God. You must never have sexual relationships, relations with a close relatives, for I am the Lord. Do not violate your mother by having sexual relationships with your mother. Do not violate your father by having sexual relationships with your mother. You want to have sexual relations with the, your father's wife, which would include stepmothers, things like that. Do not have sexual relations with your sister or half-sister. Do not have sexual relationships with your stepsister. There's a whole list of these. If you look in Leviticus 18, there's a whole list. I mean, uh, just a whole chapter written on here is, the, here is the description of what sexual immorality is. That has not changed. God's definition of sexual immorality has not changed 
from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We're not talking about shaving your beard, getting a tattoo, eating a ham sandwich. We're not talking about this. We're talking about these things as it pertains to your behavior as a Christian since your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you sin against, when you, and when you sin against your body, Paul calls it out as being something even more heinous than normal. Do not defile yourself by having sexual intercourse with your neighbor's wife. Do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Moloch. Do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin, period. But I love him. I love her. You know, what sin didn't you love? Perhaps is a better question. Of course you love sin. That's what makes it so much fun, right? You put a person on or have the more emotions, the harder it is to give up. But it is nonetheless a sin. A man must not defile himself by having sex with an animal. So if we look at the way this is positioned here, which is interesting in the sequence in Leviticus, is don't sacrifice your children to false gods, don't practice homosexuality, and don't, don't basically have sex with an animal. Those things all seem to be somewhat important. And those are the guides that we have for us today. You must not commit any of these detestable sins. So when we look at what God is doing here, it's almost like God, we go through life and perhaps we don't know Christ. And it's almost like God sends us, we're walking against the headwind. We are basically, you know, God is, is pushing back against us to reconsider our ways, to acknowledge Him, to look around and see His creation, to answer the call upon our heart. But we continue to trudge ahead and to, and to go forward resisting Him, and not acknowledging Him, blowing Him off as it were. And there is a point when God, and we, there's three gave overs, gave ups, gave overs in the end of Romans chapter 1. He gave up, he gave up, he gave them over. And this is kind of a progression of what happens here is God gave them up to their hard head. God gave them up to their hardened heart. Then God gave them up just to their total depravity and sin. All the while trying to get your attention. All the while offering you the free gift of salvation. And here's the thing, if a person, but if a person continues to live in such a way, the end result's quite clear. We talked about that last week. This is the reason the wrath of God is revealed to those who are ungodly and unrighteous, who suppress the truth. What I've tried to do tonight is give, and, and I already know, I mean, I've been around long enough to know, there, and I, I'm, again, I'm not trying to fight with anybody. I'm just preaching the word here. But there are going to be people, well, I don't believe that way. I get that. And there's people who don't believe that. They, yeah, I, I, why would that surprise me? Well, you know, we're homosexuals and we're in love and we go to church. You wouldn't have made it in that Corinthian church if Paul had found out about it. I mean, that's just the way it is. You said, you think everything's okay? No, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. You identify this person. Out they go. Well, we're lesbians, and you don't understand. We love each other, and God is love, and we love each other, and God wants our happiest. No, God wants your soul for all eternity and to save you from hell and eternal punishment. That's what God would like. But again, we try to redefine these things. So I was seeking the Lord this week and praying. And seeking the Lord and praying and studying and praying. That's just the, my lot in life. I see 20 patients a day at our business. Thank you, Lord. And I spend every morning for a couple of hours and four or five hours at night. As my wife can tell you, I just read and pray and read. I take this very seriously. And, that's not, and there's nothing magic about this. You can do it too. Okay, there's no magical thing I've got here. It's just a matter of allocating my time, and I am just as busy as most anyone else out there in the secular. But my home time is I've decided just to turn the stinking TV off. There's no news I want to watch, but there's news that I need to deliver. 
and thus the Wednesday night messages. But I wanted to share with you as we close out tonight some of the things that the Lord has laid upon my heart to share with you. And I'm just going to read them as I wrote them, and, and please forgive me for just looking down, but this is, here it is. There are no new ways to become Christ-like. Satan, however, always has new ways to drag us deeper into sin and deception. If you're always looking for something new, Satan will make sure you find it. It is a false Christianity which allows one to ignore sin, to live in sin, to promote sin. When we try to redefine sin, we are trying to redefine God's holiness. True repentance is a complete surrender of yourself to God. This is not a work. It's surrender. To invite Jesus into your heart, by definition, is to ask for a complete transformation, to become born again. And herein lies the problem for many. They want the Jesus whom they have tamed. They, the Jesus they want to see versus Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God. They want the Jesus who is livable and likable in their current worldview, not the Jesus who changes their worldview altogether. Please know there's a huge difference between adding Jesus to your life and Jesus actually changing your life. When you refuse to repent, when you refuse to see sin for what it is, when you refuse to surrender to God, you do refuse the free gift of salvation. You cannot become a Christian on your own terms. One may certainly identify themselves as a Christian, but if not truly born again, an unforgiven sinner, they shall remain. Today, many of us want Jesus as long as he checks his holiness at the door. Today, many have no problem belonging to a church as long as there's no talk of sin, no talk of eternal consequence of denying Christ, no talk of being double-minded, no talk of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, no talk of hell. But let me remind you that Christianity is not a club you join in grace with your presence whenever it's convenient. Jesus Christ is not simply another face or choice on a dating app. He is the great I am. He is the creator of all the heavens and all the earth. He is your creator. Jesus did not shed his blood for you and give his life for you for a lukewarm relationship. He's looking for a true marriage. He's not seeking to simply shack up until something better comes along. Jesus wants a true relationship, a true marriage with you. Prenuptial agreements are not allowed. Everyone on the broad road leading to destruction thinks they're right. After all, they must be. Look at all the people traveling with me. Look at all those around me who agree with me. We have a consensus. We have a majority. Certainly things must be as we believe them to be. The answer from God is simply no. When you're serving a God who always tells you what you want to hear, you're not serving a God at all. You are simply serving yourself. When we look at God's Word and we want, and we feel called, and we, we, we have that tug on our heart, if you will, and God stands at the door and knocks. Jesus is there. He wants to save us. He died for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to pull you from the fires of hell, which is exactly where you're going outside of him. He wants to rescue you from that lake of eternal fire and eternal punishment. Those are the, that is the future for those who die outside of Christ. And yet we rebel, we resist. We feel somehow that, that we couldn't live like that. I enjoy sex. I enjoy the money. I enjoy the, the, the fame, the pride. I enjoy my, you know, we, here's the thing, though. When, when Jesus is calling you from something, he's also calling you to something. And you just can't take your, your, your whole luggage set full of sin with you. Jesus says in Mark 1.15, repent and believe. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Jesus says, I died for you. I love you. I loved you before you even heard about me. I loved you before you even heard about me. 
And he loves each one of you here tonight. He loves each one of you watching. Jesus loves you. He shed his blood for you. He died for you. He calls you. But yet you have a decision to make. You have a choice to make. You, are, you have your moral choice, your freedom of will. What will you say to the risen Christ? Who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus to me? Is he just a great teacher? Is he just a prophet? Is he some old guy we read about, I've heard about, Jesus loves me, this I know, however that song goes. Who is Jesus Christ, the risen Christ? Who is Jesus to you tonight? That's the question you must absolutely own in your heart. To know him. Not to know of him. Not to talk about him. I am not calling you to church. I'm not calling you to religion. I am calling you to Jesus Christ. Because he is the only way. He is the only truth. And he is the only life. Everything outside of him perishes. And you're saying, well, that's narrow, that's divisive, that's exclusive, that's offensive. You mean to say that I'm wrong or he's wrong. I'm saying everyone outside of Christ goes to hell. Wow, that's hard stuff, Pastor Tom. I'm going to turn this channel off. Turn it off. I'm not changing the message. But I will share the truth. Why should I expect such a message would be received? Jesus Christ himself came and they hung him on a cross. Paul was beheaded. Peter hung, you know, crucified upside down. Look at the martyrs. I mean, wh why would we expect people to embrace this message of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life? And therein lies the problem. We basically, we want, to, we want to preach a gospel and preach a message that appeals to the sinner. Like we need their endorsement. No, you need the endorsement of the Almighty God. You need Jesus' stamp of approval on your life, not the unchurched masses who are trying to tell you how to run a church or how to build a congregation. You need Jesus to say amen to you. Not what the unchurched says. Let's, let's look for people who, what, what are they looking for? They don't know what they're looking for. How dare we go outside the church to find what they're looking for? Because if the Bible be true, they are dead in their sins and trespasses. What can they possibly add to the body of Christ? What can they possibly add to the body of Christ? No, we need to have a message that's firm and un, unwavering that Jesus Christ loves them. And Satan hates them. The sin that we are in, there is no way out of that outside of Christ. I mean, I know. You start talking like this and preaching like this, oh, that's fire and brimstone. Get over the dessert menu Christian life you're living. Let me just be frank with you. It sickens me that all people want to hear about is the dessert menu. I look on Facebook, all the Christian memes. It's, none of them calling people to repent. It's about oh, how God loves you so much. What about the person living in adultery? Does that meme apply to them as well? What would Paul say to them? What would Paul say to them? We're afraid to call it out. And I'm all for encouragement, and I'm all for rah, rah. You know, we're more than conquerors, and all things are work together for good. It's not going to work together for good if you're living in sin and not repenting of it. It's not going to work together for good if you're in a lifelong homosexual relationship or lesbian relationship or committing adultery or shacking up. Which Bible are you reading? It doesn't work out okay. Well, I like this. I feel good. Of course you do. That's what sin is all about. But is, there, is it worth your soul? I was part of a church meeting type thing, leadership meeting which was very good, very wise, anointed men and women were on there in the Zoom thing. And there was a common consensus among all the Christian leaders, 
that everything was basically going to hell in a handbasket. That was the takeaway. To use the day's vernacular, forgive me, but that's just what it was. That this may be a, a wake-up call. This may be a precursor. This, the worst may be yet, you know, is yet to come. All these types of things, and I'm cool with that. I don't know where we're at in the biblical prophecy eschatological line, uh, timeline, but let's just say that's true. Well, those of us who know Jesus, just for, let's just imagine that is true. Okay, now how should we live? We need to be out there talking about salvation in Christ. We may, may be talk, you may, we can talk about politics all you want, but the simple truth is people need Jesus a lot more than they need Donald Trump. Did you know that? That's just a fact. That's just a fact, and I'm not trying to, you know, that's, that's a different thing. I'm not going to talk politics. I don't care. I'm an American citizen. I'm going to vote, and I don't care who wins. I do care, but whatever happens, guess what? I'm going to work the next day because I work every day. I'm going to continue to preach the word. I'm going to continue to work, and who wins, who loses, all I can do is vote. Praise God, but whatever happens, I'm going to work, and I'm going to preach the gospel. That's it, as boring as my life is. If we're in the end times, if we're coming down the home stretch, if things are getting worse and all the conspiracy tri- okay, how then should you live? You should be living with an eye towards winning souls because if this is the end times, if we are coming down the, around the fourth curve, if, at the fourth corner, why, when, when do you plan to start sharing your testimony? When do you plan to start inviting people to share with them the teaching, the church attendance, the videos, whatever? How are you going to reach people? We have a responsibility. We're talking about, you know, on the weekend services now about being filled with the Holy Ghost and seeking the spiritual gifts. And that's praise God. I'm a Pentecostal, ordained Pentecostal, tongue-speaking you know, somewhere between a, you know, Martin Lloyd-Jones and Smith Wigglesworth, and basically some people would just call me confused, but I absolutely feel, no that the power of the Holy Ghost and the gifts are real today and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But I also know that we must have sound biblical doctrine on which to stand and not be a bunch of fruit loops. But I also know this, as we grow in our understanding of God's Word and as we grow in the presence of God, as He grows within us, as we become less and He becomes greater and the gifts become manifest, ultimately they must result in being, being witnesses throughout the ends of the earth. You shall receive power from on high and then do what with it? Stand and look in a mirror? No, you will share the good news of the gospel. You will do it with power. You will do it with signs and wonders following. That's who God has called you to be. Jesus is not politically correct. Jesus is, does not care about today's politics. Jesus cares about those people who are created in his image, which is everybody. He's looking for their salvation. He, he's not willing that any should perish. God so loved his own, his, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Those who gain Christ lose nothing. That is what you need to know. Many of you are hedging your bets. You're kind of thinking, well, I can't give this up. I mean, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Let me share with you that there is nothing that there, when you repent of your sin and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, he's not going to just leave you hanging, okay? Okay? Oh, I could never live like this. I could never do without this. He died for you. And you're right. On your own power, perhaps you could not. With the Holy Spirit living within you as one who is regenerate, old things have passed away, all things have become new. As He renews you and you are born again, I would submit to you, yes, you can. And He will be in it with you every moment and every step of the way. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, Father, for clear instruction. We thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross, that you shed your blood, that you rose on that third day. And, Lord, we do profess you as Lord. And I would pray for any of you here tonight or any of you who are watching by way of 
media. That if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to quit running, quit struggling, quit living in vexation and doubt and turmoil, quit simply not knowing why you're even here, I would encourage you to pray with me. Dear God, I come to you and I ask for forgiveness. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to truly repent and turn away from my sins. I accept Jesus Christ. I surrender all unto you, Father God. And I ask that Jesus Christ would come into my heart and to be my Lord and to be my Savior and to fill me with his presence and the power of his Spirit. Make me new. I want to be born again. I want to be a new creation in Jesus Christ. Lord, help me. Guide me. I don't know what to do. But Father, I come to you. Dear God, I come to you. I ask for your help. I ask for your salvation. I ask that you would be with me and teach me and counsel me and comfort me. Starting this very moment. I proclaim Jesus Christ as my Lord. I confess that he was born of a virgin. He walked upon the earth. He was crucified. He shed his blood for me. He died. He was buried. And he rose again. And he lives forevermore. This is the Jesus whom I proclaim. This is the Jesus who I profess as my Lord. And Father, it's in this name, Jesus' name, that I pray. Amen and amen.